<laughs> Very funny. Uh. running live primetime musical variety television show in the United States. Now think about that, Say in the United States. We've had over 5,000 guests on the show. Now we really dig doing what we're doing here, just put it, putting it all together. And, and uh, you know, the, without the, the big money issue, a lot more fun, a lot more easy going, and a lot more t uh, talent just exudes when you're doing this type of thing. It's a beautiful uh, situation. But once again, I'm, I'm gonna do a, a little bit of thing on the treadmill. You ever get on the treadmill? Yeah, I just had a nice checkup, turned out pretty well. But I'm down here to keep my, the cardio thing together. I, I do the treadmill, do an hour on that. Oh, no, not an hour, 30 minutes. A little bit of running on there. I do a kind of a bicycle issue. And then a, uh, I don't even know what you call it, back and forth deal. You'll see me when I when I get on there. So, you know, trying to get the body together. That's what you got to do. You know, when you're uh, when you've had these issues. And that's kind of what keeps me alive and happy. We're we're trying to reach 1,000 television shows, right? After this show, we'll have 19 more to do. This has been a labor of love. The idea of just doing this is more than just a notion. More than just a notion. And it's a beautiful thing because you know stuff doesn't get in your way, not a lot of crap happening, and it's a, a gorgeous thing for humanity to get together and make things happen. So anyway, let me get my little self on the, uh, my favorite one is down there, the little treadmill. When I was a kid, I never, ever wanted to join a gym, fitness club. Hell no, was, I'm, I'm a man, I'm tall, I'm strong, I'm young. But when things happen you're later in life, you do it because for me it's very healthy. So I think I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna get on another machine. So we'll, we'll do this, maybe do a little song a little later and then we'll kind of drizzle out to Denny Geyer's home. Sit and talk with Denny, 60 years old, been in the music business. Nobody's ever heard of him. And yet he's been on all the big national television shows in, in his day. You know? So anyway, we'll see you a little while. I'm going to do this for a bit.
take a lot of lessons to be able to do that, and that's why I did it, because I was able to take lessons. I'm surrounded by balls. you? <laughs> Let me see your ID. I got I got my ID oh, card too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Here, hey, take this. Oh, nice. Shit, put it on my eyeglasses, dude. <laughs> How you doing, Bruce? Good, man. Thanks for having uh, having us over today. Good to this, see you. It's going to be kick butt. <laughs> oh, I'll come in. Come on in. I'll get all my stuff ready. Oh, oh this part of the place is beautiful. <laughs> oh. It's a mansion, yeah. okay, uh, it's a mansion, all right. I was wearing a hat or two, I just... Oh, I love hats. I mean, I was... Oh, man, does that feel good? Good old bottle of water right next to a clear lake. Ah, this is gorgeous. Oh, I, went, I had a good time at the, uh, uh, at the uh, spa or the, the gym. City Fitness, nice place. People do a lot, a lot of good things there. You can get people to come on in. And, come over here we're at uh, my friend's house and we just kind of getting together and get a feeling of what's happening and getting the cameras all set up and and that because you're going to be you I'm gonna take you on a journey uh, somebody like him should be noticed all over the world and he's a man he's been he's been performing at least 60 years in his life and he and yet nobody knows them. And to me, that strikes that strikes a chord. But on the other hand, you're watching, and you're going to learn a little bit about what this cat has gone through. The television shows he's been on over the years. His uh, name is Denny Geyer, or maybe it was Dennis Geyer. Both, but Dennis sounds like my mother's mad at me. So. Your mother's mad at you, and she says Dennis. Denny, I prefer Denny. Yeah, Denny. Yeah. It's how you said about your mom and dad. You, you, were either of them musical? No. Uh, my mom uh, never had a career in music, but she had. She liked playing. She had a singing. musical soul. She was born and raised in the South. Well, yes. so was my dad. Gotcha. 
But um, huh. my mom had this feeling, and I remember when I was a child, uh, you know, before television, that we'd have the radio on, and she'd say, listen, listen to that beat, or listen, you know, listen to that horn, you know, listen to that guitar. Um, and I remember I used to sit on the kitchen floor with a spoon and, and, and a, a fork, and as a little kid, I'd sit on the kitchen floor and play drums on the nice. linoleum floor. Nice, you know? man. I relate to that. I, I, went, I did a similar thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so mom was a helper in her way. Oh, sort of. well, she, uh, like I say, she had this southern soul. You know, I grew yeah, up listening yeah, to, yeah. like, she loved southern gospel music. Yes. Southern gospel quartets. I did too. Dixie Hummingbirds. Yeah. Soul Stirrers, Pilgrim Travelers. Yeah, yeah. And she liked that? Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, I grew up listening to it, and I still, as I got older, I bought all these, uh, well, first phonograph records, and then when CDs came out, I bought everything on CD, and I've got many, many gospel uh, CDs, which I still listen to because they inspire the heck out of me. Okay. And also, a lot of it was <laughs> was where yeah. rockabilly and rock and roll and rhythm and blues came from. Yeah. Here you're a man. You 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 came out of was it Wisconsin? Did I say. Yeah, and I was born and raised in yeah. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee. But I left I left Milwaukee when I was 17. Uh, I started college at the University of Wisconsin at 17, and... Uh, Where was the big choice? Where well, you said, I'm going to play music and that's all. So tell me uh, about Well, I, I knew it when I was in college. I was studying business administration, which I only took because I had no idea what I wanted to do. I figured I wanted to play music. Back in those days, they didn't have all the classes they have today and all the specializing. It was like you either became a teacher, uh, you, you did pre-law or wanted to be a doctor or something. I mean, it was all general, general things. Uh, and the school that I went to was uh, geared towards producing teachers because in the, in the early 60s and mid 60s, I started in 61, um, the country was just crying for teachers. And I knew I didn't want to do it. I just went through school to... Just sort of do it, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's full time or something? Well, my parents wanted... They always said, if, you know, you got to have something to fall back on. Of course, on. yeah. Well, I've never fell back on. In fact, I don't even know where my diploma is. You know? Wow. Do you actually got one? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, I should probably put it on a wall someplace. You'd think so. There could be some wall in, in Wisconsin or in Milwaukee. A wall in there, Wisconsin? Uh, you know, <laughs> and it's hanging on the wall, you know. People walk by it every day. <laughs> I'll hang it on the ladies' room next to where it says, for a good time, call Denny. <laughs> Very funny. Uh, I mean, you can imagine what, what someone like Sam Cooke would be doing today if he was still alive, or Elvis Presley. Um, what would they be doing musically, you know? Uh, senior citizens uh, places. Yeah, they'd be playing senior facilities yes. with me. Oh, hell yeah. 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 Hi, Sam. Well, I <laughs> do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you want to do, you send me? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember the words. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, so my, my mother was a, she was a, 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 she wasn't a front listener, but she loved listening to this kind of music, and she didn't, nobody would know, you know, turn on. So I, 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 I grew up with listening to a lot of soul stirs on all these yeah. people. I'm really happy. And it got it really unopened or opened my heart or my soul. Where uh, so, but where did it finally come out to you that you you're going to be a musician? Uh, what has happened to you? When I was in college, I had a year or so left, and I I just I never actually said it to myself, but I just knew I wanted to play music, and that was it. And I haven't told nothing anybody. else. It, it was my passion, yeah. and nothing else was. 
No, you couldn't get. You couldn't get. Except for Barbara Lumpke, but she didn't. Barbara want Lumpke. Yeah, she was in me. seventh grade. She no. didn't want anything to do with I me. I got so. Yeah. I said I'll take music. Well, that's what you had to do, and then just kind of pick up all you know as you go along. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I you're, you're a guitar guy, and then yeah. What were you? I uh, know you mentioned spoon and and fork. Well, were there other instruments that you had played early on? No, I tried to play harmonica, but uh, when we had a band in Wisconsin in 1965 or six, and uh, I had been playing, you know, like Paul Butterfield came out, and I oh, thought, well, yeah. I can, put this you know, I can, I can do this, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so I, you know, I bought harps for like 250 at that time. Now they're yeah. like yeah. a simple marine band harp. I think is 25 dollars or something. Yeah. Um, so I started playing harmonica, you know, simple blues stuff. Yes. Because I, I had fallen in love with, uh, uh, I discovered the blues in 1962 yes. when I was in college on WLAC out of Nashville, Tennessee. And they played nothing 24 hours a day, nothing but blues. Junior yeah. Parker, Freddie King, B.B. King, Muddy Waters, Sonny Boy Williamson. And I got to see all these guys before uh, they became uh, known by uh, white folks, white audiences. You know? So the but, so the blues was the beginning of the, how it goes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You came over here to California, and and then hey, uh, you've done so many things, and some of the the gigs that, that I want to talk about are uh, the Queen Ida. Yeah, when. Uh, I joined Ida in uh, early '84, and her career was just starting to just take, take off. off. Ladies and gentlemen, Queen Ida and the Bon Ton Zydeco Band. <laughs> Sometime before you had you had your, your your pain with your back, you were getting you were doing things at uh, senior homes and right. stuff. Yeah, I imagine they, you know, you're going from Queen Ida and all this thing to senior homes, and but I'm thinking it still must be a, really a wonderful gig. People well, love you. That you know what I mean. I'll they're, tell they're, you, they're, they're kind of hurt. They're in pain. They're you know, know you know it's a pretty you know what it was, Bruce was a. Uh, I left Queen Ida uh, in '91, and I went with uh, Zazu Pitts Memorial. Yes, Memorial I, I, I totally you. remember them. Yes. But uh, and then I joined uh, Lisa Kindred's uh, oh, blues band, and I was. She had Lisa. come on our show, with Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> Like that. Yeah, all right. Yeah. 
Yeah, we are. Wonderful. Uh, I was with Lisa like 22 years. I just That's left amazing. before I came up here. Huh? Yeah, but um, in in the late in the last like 10 years, uh, gigs were dropping off. Yeah. You know, for the, like I say, for the older cats like myself, um, San Francisco doesn't offer a lot for older musicians. Yeah. My mom lived in Wisconsin and she was failing in 2004 and passed away. And when I was back there, I would, they asked me, you know, she would say, my son is a musician, you know. <laughs> and so they said, would you play for the folks here? And I that's said, how it started? Sure, that's, that's how it started. Yeah. And so every time I'd go back to visit my mom, I'd, <laughs> I'd do an hour for the folks, you know, and I thought, all of a sudden, like about a year later, I'm back in San Francisco, you know, and I'm saying, wait a minute, why don't I do that out here? I can make some money because the band yes. business for for me and, like I say, the older cats was really dwindling. So I started doing them and I did them for 11 years. And that's that was my primary source of income because I could not live off the money I made with band gigs. I was working with Lisa Kendra was working with Mel Sharp. Mel Sharp is still yeah. one of my all-time favorite humorists yeah, yeah. around. Oh yeah, he's fantastic. He was on our show at one time, and, and I think yeah. you were on that show as yeah, well. Yeah, I brought him in, yeah. We do look alike, that's why I brought this shade. Put on the shade, I, I will, on. I will, I've got well, them right here. Yeah, 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 let's do this, you're right. I think my nose look. is a little smaller. No, but when you get the thing, But when I get this on, then, but yeah, no oh, what? Oh yeah. yeah. Isn't that? That's it. We got we got to work yeah. on this, Mel. Kind of like the Blues Brothers in Pacifica. <laughs> I tell you, huh? yeah. yeah. <laughs> Blues Brothers at assisted living. Oh, <laughs> yeah. He's a really a wonderful cat. And, oh yeah. Uh, I, I love I love him. So I don't know, man. Your, your career is just it's a, it goes, it's a wonderful thing because it doesn't just all the same. It's you know what it is. Yeah. Uh, well, I've worked you know, primarily with uh, three or four different bands over about. 50 years and the best years were when I came out here in 68 with A.B. Sky because yeah. yeah. we did uh, uh, we auditioned at the Avalon Ballroom the day after we arrived and the manager loved us and uh, took us under his wing at Chet Helms Chet, oh, and yeah. we did a lot of shows at the Avalon Ballroom opening up for the, the biggest stars in blues rock and psychedelic music right. and we were a simple like urban Chicago based blues band uh, but we could warm up a crowd real well and we weren't threatening to the stars yeah, for the others, yeah. we weren't doing what they were doing and then Bill Graham uh, decided he liked us and he stole us away from Chet Helms and we did a lot of shows at the Fillmore West. Uh, God, what a time shows. frame. You've been in sort of different, uh, I mean, huge things were happening in each of these time frames that you've lived in your life. Yeah. And now we're sort of here. You yeah. know, you got this beautiful lake out in front. And, uh, and you're, you're starting, you're getting your playing together. Yeah, I'm starting to play again, yeah. yeah it's a, which uh, it's which a was uh, the most difficult thing I've ever had to go through and because uh, when I had it was actually uh, I wish I could say that my injury was caused uh, in bed by being with a circus contortionist but yes, uh, yes. It, that wasn't it uh, <laughs> I was I, I bought a microwave oven for a friend of mine who needed one I was going to surprise her with it and I was leaving Best Buy in coma and I you know, it was a big, you know, microwave carrying it. Mm. And I saw this curve, and my car was right on the other side of the curve, and the curve was marked red, bright red, and I saw it. And I stepped mm. over it with my right foot, and my left foot either clipped it or got caught on top, and I belly flopped. I shattered my knee oh. into seven pieces. And then uh, I had surgery the next day, and then. Uh, they, they put a full length cast on because I couldn't bend my knee for three months. And so I was on a walker. And I thought, my God, you know, I've been playing all these senior facilities where all these folks are on walkers. Yeah, yeah. And I said, 
God, now I'm, you know, I'm one of them all of a sudden, you know. And, Isn't that uh, a weird thing? I mean, when you, you actually understand that? I mean, I was pretty much in, in, immobile for eight, nine months, almost God. a year, because I couldn't, I couldn't bend over, I couldn't lift anything. I, I crushed a, a vertebrae in my lower spine, and they, they, they showed me the x-ray, you know, the, it looks like an accordion, it just went, Jeez. you know, there's nothing there. Yeah. There's nothing they can do about that. Can't fuse it no, again. No, no, it there. just heals and that's it. Oh, uh, so I'm almost an inch shorter than I was two years ago. <laughs> God. Well, that, that's, I don't know what to say about that. But uh, I'll tell you, I want to get back to the uh, the senior gigs, you know, the, yes. the beautiful thing. You know, when I started doing them when my mom was alive <clears throat> back in Wisconsin, and I got the idea to start doing them out here was um, at first when I did them, I would go into these senior facilities, you know, rehab, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, skilled nursing, uh, assisted living. And at first it was depressing because here are all these folks having a tough time, you know. And, yeah. yeah. And some of the, like, the, especially the rehab units, you know, they smell like a hospital. And, yeah, and uh, yeah. it was kind of depressing. And then, after a few months, I realized how inspiring these people were. Right. Because these people could still, they were hurting or they were on their way out, uh, but they could still find, you know, when I'd play for them, they would smile and some of them would walk by me and, and, and say thank you, you know. And I thought, we spent our whole lives trying to, trying to get trying to accumulate things. Yeah, 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 that's right. You know, yeah. money, belongings, uh, everything. And I, uh, all of a sudden I realized this is the first Boom. time in my life yeah. that I felt like I was giving something back. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's And huge. it was the greatest feeling yeah. in the world. And Big time. so I did it for 11 years, plus play with the, yeah. the bands, but the bands didn't work that I'm, just, I'm so pleased that you t it took the moment to sort of, you know, uh, to expound on that, because some folks have no idea what what it is to give and receive, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, I, I, you know, that's that's our gig, that's our life, that's what we're doing here. You know, you're a young child, you come in, you do, you get interested in something, you school this, you do that, you're a musician, and by the time you're done, you've sort of accumulated whatever, and that's that's the point. But it's not the point. The point is be who you are. Yeah. Sure. You know, do do the whole thing. Hey, the, real quick, cause I think we might, at some point, I want to go look at your uh, hat. Is that a hat on your head? It better be. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let, I wanted to see what the new audience proudly presents from the Graceland Tour, Lady Smith Black Mom Basil, very special guest Queen Ida and her bon Temp Zydeco band. That was at Carnegie Hall. Yep. 1986. In 1986, December 12th. Paul Simon, because... They, they were the guys that sang on his Graceland album, the, the incredible I can, classic I, I album. I totally remember and believe it. And he showed up that <laughs> night and he's, he sang with them. Wow. He came in and sang with them uh, for a few tunes. So was, did you, I mean, did you ever think in your mind, but see, you were on a real fast rise, that you would ever play a place like that? No. Carnegie Hall? Uh, in fact, um, I mean, you know, you. I never even uh, dreamed of it or expected it. Um, in fact, throughout my whole career, I never really set a goal like uh, I want to accomplish this in six months or a year, I, or I want to be here or there. Uh, I just I followed my heart and I followed the music. Yeah, yeah. And the music took me from one band to another, and every band was a little different. And every band had uh, different kind of gigs, yes. some better than <coughs> others. You know, like A.B. Sky was, was good, Queen Ida was good, Zazu Pitts was good. A couple of the others were just club bands where we made a living, yeah. you know. But uh, I just let no, it's a wise the music, thing. I just follow the music. Follow your, whatever you call it now, follow your muse. Yeah. 
Chills uh, and that's what you do, you know, right. to get to the right place instead of staying with the same old thing forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Which yeah. is kind of what I've done, but mine, mine is a little different, and I'm near the sort of the end of my journey. Uh, uh, we're trying to reach a thousand shows, you know. That. Yeah, you're close. And, but at the end of what we do today, uh, well, nine, it'll be 19. So that, that's pretty sweet, but I, that's what I've done. I've always sort of followed you know, where my feelings are, not where the big money is. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with getting big money. I just, I wanted to be my own guy, you know? But, well, well, you I'm are. Sort of make, uh, make a you know, feeling of what the hell's going on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm thinking, uh, is it time to, to look at your hats? I don't know, Ed, can we look at hats? This will be exciting. This will be exciting, yeah. I'm going to bring my uh, walking cane and... Uh, uh, i got a cane here for you. The you want. bowler? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I th did you wear that once on the show? Sure, sure. Yeah, God. Well, a friend of mine, he, he worked in a hat, a house of hats. Uh, Cohen. Oh, I love this. Cohen boy? He'd my dad him. had... My dad had a bowler, and that's what gave me the idea. Yeah. Yeah. And it had a had a rip in here, and he always said, "Well, that's that was from a, a gunshot wound." Jesus. <laughs> <clears throat> I got pictures of him in the twenties where he dressed like a gangster. I mean, he looked like the mob. You Isn't know? that something? Yeah. Well, he was one of these streetwise guys. Yeah, yeah. I, I I remember some of those photos, and my dad, when we had, when I had a dad, where it was he was a, he was slick, you know. Oh yeah. Pretty slick. Oh, I mean, he had the, the hat with the brim pulled down, yeah, the yeah, long yeah. trench coat, suit with a vest and a tie, you know. And the kid, yeah, yeah, that's a big thing, the chain thing. Oh, he walked around that and he had big old coins in his pocket and jingle them, you know. So. And, and you'd like hear that. the goddamn the noise, you know. Yeah, yeah. And he'd want one of those uh, coins in his pocket. Oh, you know? man. Take I mean, he looked like. Over to me. Yeah, yeah. Huh? I mean, they, you know, he looked like a gangster, man. Another the fellow who worked in the House of Hats in San Francisco, Alan Cohen. And that's, that's he, he saw those the, the yeah. hats. Yeah. And, and well, he was a to write his poetry and he'd write his, you know, shit. He was a, kind of an interesting guy uh, in, the, in, the, in the hip scene. Yeah. And, uh, and that, but I, I couldn't imagine working in a hat, hat shop. Well, there was a there was a fellow in Geary. He closed thirty years ago, but it was called Paul's Hat Shop, and he not only uh, sold hats from other manufacturers, but he made hats huh. himself. He was a great. He was a dying art, uh -huh. uh, a hat maker, yes. and I got to know him and. Uh, he would help me. I would steam my own hats, you know. I would, I would like this hat didn't look. I mean, good. just kind of take it and put it in front of your mouth, and you go. <sighs> Is that how <laughs> no, no, no. You get a tea kettle, oh, and you get the water boiling, and the steam comes up. Ah, and you put it. Cause I used to go into these Western wear shops, and I watch yeah. these guys steam hats, and they just they had a steamer, an actual steamer. Yeah. Well, I would take a tea kettle, get the water coming up, the steam coming up. Huh. I'd move around the part of the hat that I wanted to move, and then I'd take it away. And if you do it in like 10, 15 seconds, you can move it and hold it, and it'll stay. Oh, and if it's good felt, it yeah. stays. Yeah. And I would, I would uh, uh, reshape all my hats that way. All, almost every one of these hats. You have shaped them somewhere. Yeah. God. Yeah. That's wonderful, man. What, when did this uh, sort of happen to you? This well, I learned story? how to do it from this guy at Paul's Hat Shop in, oh, Paul, in the okay. 80s. Right. And uh, and he would, uh, we got to know each other and become friends, and he loved music. So I could bring in any one of my hats, and he would shape it for me. And you know, he was a pro, yeah. so he did it quickly and really well, you know. And speaking of shapes, I noticed on your right hand, you have two rings. What where, where, where are the, you don't have to tell me if it's really, you know. No. What's that one or what's that one? These are my parents' wedding rings. Oh, shh. Yeah, this is my dad's and my mom's. Wow. And uh, wow. I, when they, my dad died in 1990, my mom in 2004, and I've been wearing them ever since. Wow. You know, so that kind of keeps them 
Yeah, they're right there. With me, yeah. Because they were, I was really blessed. I had, I had great parents. I mean, they, they, they loved me. They look out for me. Uh, I could manipulate my mom real good, but my dad was like, oh, you're a little tough, just right? took a look, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, good. that's <laughs> enough. But he would give me, he yeah. would give me, bound, you know, there would be boundaries, and I could, I could go, I could step out of line. But if I went too far, he would reel me back. Cause he was a fisherman. It's like having a fish on a hook. Yeah. You know, you let him go a little bit, and then you reel him in a little bit. Well, he would do that with me if I got out of line. And uh, yeah, you were a lucky guy, cause a lot of people have no 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 such yeah. thing. I didn't. No. Yeah. I was three or four years old. My parents split up. There were six children, and he just that was it. He was gone. Yeah. So now I'm going. Where's my dad? And then then when my mom got sick. Uh, uh, then we had to be foster home kids. Yeah. What a bitch, man. So when, when I stand here, I almost quake in my shoes, but in a very gentle way down the middle of my back, of thoughts like that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, this is a good story. Uh, my dad used to tell me stories, you know, when I was in my teens, about how when he was a young man, and he, he and his buddies, you know, they were... They were street guys. They were street fighters. Yeah, they would me too. they would fight. They would bust places up. Yeah. They went into a restaurant one time. They found some glass and a bowl of chili. The guy wouldn't give them another bowl of chili, so they destroyed the restaurant. Yeah, he and yeah. his buddies, you know, and they were. But in the twenties, there were a lot of young men like that, you know. Yeah, um, yeah it's the 20s. Uh, we're here in 2018, the 20s. God damn it, uh, the whole bond market fell apart. There was no money oh, yeah. around, and, and, yeah. and things just got a little... So little he awkward. would tell me these stories of these things that he and his, <laughs> his buddies had done that were, you know, nothing, no serious crimes, but I mean, they just, if they wanted to rip a place apart, they would, you know, yeah. stuff like that, getting fights. So anyway, one time I was 19, I was in college, we finished a gig, and my buddy in the band and I, we picked up a couple girls and we played a high school dance, and we took them back to their high school, and there was a, a municipal pool outdoors, and it was summer, so we climbed the fence, and we were going to go swimming with these two girls, yeah. you know. This was in Watertown, Wisconsin. I don't know, maybe 10,000 people. And all of a sudden, you know, it was like midnight, and at the top of the hill, all of a sudden, these bright lights hit us, and sirens are going off, and God. it's the police, and they arrest Phil and myself yeah. for being with these two women. Now, we, they for told being us, with the women, yeah. yeah, we thought they were 18, and, you know, they were 16 and 17. Yeah, so yeah. They, they take us into separate rooms. This was like 1962. They take us in the, at the police department. They take Phil into one room and me into another. Like it's a murder investigation. Yeah, like it's terrible. This is big. <laughs> and they interrogate yeah. us and they let us, they finally let us go because nothing ever happened. We never got it to the point where we took our clothes off and went in the pool. Yeah, the cops yeah. stopped us. Yeah. And so it even made the local paper. I mean, it was like uh, whitewater students arrested in municipal <laughs> pool with underage girls. Underage girl is a big. It was a big. It was a big, big, it was a big it was a news article. You know, I mean, nothing happened. So That's ridiculous. I went back yeah. and and I, <sighs> you know, I I had never disappointed my parents really. You know, and I I felt terrible about it. And even though. Whitewater was like 50 miles from Milwaukee. I thought, what if they found out about it? God. Well, I thought, I'm going to tell them so that if they find out about yeah. it. So I tell the story, and my mom's kind of like, oh, <laughs> oh my son, Denny, did you, Denny did, did this? Did you did that? But oh. my dad, well, I'm telling the whole story. I said, well, Dad, I mean, you've told me all these stories about you and your buddies who bus in a restaurants were in fights all the time and doing all this stuff and and my dad looks at me and he just says but I never got caught. Oh <laughs> <laughs> a great last line yeah. man. And that was the end of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I never God. got caught. 
How fun. And man. he's got a, a little smirk on his face. You know? Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know what? Let's, uh, let's try to, because I think our time may be, I don't know where we're coming to a, uh, a short, I don't know, it's going to say an end, but you know, your time doesn't come to an end until it's at the end. But maybe we can play a little music or sure. something, huh? Sure. Yeah, man, that's cool. Sure. Thanks for showing the hats. I think it's beautiful. That's thrilling, I'll tell you. One day I want to get into wearing a hat or two. I just Oh, I love hats. I mean, I've worn them all my life. Yeah. I'm just a fool. A fool in love with you. Someday I'll be the vision of your happiness, Earth Angel, Earth Angel. Please be mine, my darling dear. I love you all the time. I'm just a fool, a fool in love, in love with you. Boy, you got me down there, buddy. Hey. Thank you so much. That was so much fun. Hey, listen. We should get a tour bus and a manager. We get the tour bus and uh, we, we get movies. all the senior homes. And then we get, we get the big state, the state ones at the state, you know, at the fairgrounds. Yeah. And, uh, and get all the people who like those old songs. I like the old songs. Like the young folks today uh, listen to a lot of music that I don't care for. But I, I can put back to 1955 and 56 when I fell in love with Fats Domino, Little Yo, Richard, Charlie. Elvis, Gene Vincent, <laughs> Jerry Lee Lewis. There were probably a lot of... Now, my mom loved it. I mean, she loved this because she was just, she had so much rhythm, you know. Uh, but I'm sure there were a lot of my mom's friends who couldn't stand it, the yeah. rockabilly. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it set my soul on fire and it's still burning and I'm grateful for that. Well, you're still burning, man. I, I'm loving it. I, I'm, I, I don't know if you want to now because uh, I don't know what, where, where we are in our immediate time frame. But is there like some little song you play? You just play something on your own for a few minutes. I don't know what it is, huh? I don't really get to perform these things, so... Uh, You're right, this is cool. You wrote this. I think you told me that. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I like the song. It's on yeah. my, I think it's off my first CD. I mean, that that's under my name. I've done a lot of recording. I'm on 45 or 50 records, cassettes, CDs, 8-tracks. Holy moly. Which you don't hear a whole lot of. It. Let's see if I can make my way through this, okay? Yeah, man. It's called Tell Me What You Mean. Tell me what you mean, baby, whoa, that you don't love me. Tell me what you mean, baby, whoa, that you don't love me. Look me straight in the eye. Tell me the truth, now don't you tell me no lie. Tell me what you mean, baby, whoa, that you don't love me.
don't you, now don't you tell me no lies Tell me what you mean, baby, oh, oh that it's all my fault Oh, that was really nice, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, Thank you. I remember it quite well, because I think you said it was one of the, was it one of the two songs that you wrote or no? I've written a lot of songs, lot of songs. and I did, I've done quite oh, singing. a few on your shows, but I, yeah. you know, I've done a lot of your shows over the years. See, Dennis Guy and his friends are on our stage right now. Would you put your hand together, please, for Dennis Guy and his friends? Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you Chris. Yeah. yeah. Because I've got, I've got uh, VCR tapes of a lot of them, and some of them on DVD. Well, I think we're going to have to do that again. This is, you know, this, I, uh, th this is a big deal to me. It's very important, and, and maybe somebody somewhere in some land, or maybe in California, somebody will walk up to you and look you in the eye and squeeze your little chinny and say, aren't you Denny Geyer? <laughs> and then you, you know, just basically kick him in the nuts. But. <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> no, and you say yeah, and they say, well, I enjoyed listening to your show, and some part of your, your, your yourself was growing up right there, as you were speaking about it, and, and that's really important to us. That's what we're trying to do, you know, in our lives, and maybe you do too. Uh, you know, we we like one thing. We only like one thing. That's it. And the rest of it is, is nothing. Is no nobody. We, you know, we like the biggest song and the on the, the latest thing where, where they sell music and 
and they just overlook people like yourselves, millions of people in the world. It's kind of like being married. Did you say something? <laughs> <laughs> But I gotta tell you, one of the times yeah. I did your show, uh, I had a woman come up to me at, at a senior facility, and she had seen the show. Oh yes. And and she said, when when we did the interview, uh, you know, you always get a, pour a cup of something oh, yeah. you know, yeah, to yeah, give yeah. to the guests. Yeah. And I I reached over for it, and I was afraid of spilling it, and my hand was kind of shaking, and uh. and she. Reminded me of that a few days later after she had seen the show, and that's when I think the first time I did your show, you handed me a, a, a yeah. cup of something, yeah, and you yeah, said yeah. it was panther urine. That's right, panther urine. And I thought, oh great, you know, this 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 just what I need. Well, maybe I could run faster, you know. But I mean, it was like she said, yeah, your hand was shaking. I said, well, I I was kind of worried about spilling it, you know. Well, it was a fun thing, and it was a good time, and you came and you shared with us, and you've really done it today. It's a, to me, it's a special little ball of yarn or something that we've, we've created just by talking about and, yeah. and playing a little music and, and having fun with it. I just love you for coming to this place, man. Oh, thank so you. For me coming into your place. It's like I was telling uh, uh, Steve and Ed, you know, um, for a couple of months now, you've been coming <laughs> over about once a week, and we do exactly this. We sit down, we talk. We tell stories. We have serious discussions, and then we'll something comes up and it's funny, and you know, uh, and Bruce will give me that that look, like you know, like when, when he that he does to the camera, you know, it's just like he'll look at me like <laughs> and not say a word, you know. Yeah. And it's like okay, <laughs> but I mean, we've been doing this and just yeah. having fun doing it, and that's why it's a that's it's a, a joy. There's no no, you know, there's not that many great things that happen in our, in our lives, especially as sort of musicians, and and these are the one, one of the great things. To, you know, you're not you know, just you know, you're not reading it off a book or this or that. It's just right. sort of unfolds our stories. Are interesting and and people can relate to them. It's a big time, yeah, thing to me. Thanks uh, for Ed to, uh, coming up here, yeah, all the way from San Francisco. And thanks for Steve for coming all the way from Half Moon Bay, getting oh, in the wow. car and getting up here at like nine o'clock in the in the morning. And thanks for the people at uh, yeah. uh, at the at the at the gym this morning. And that was quite good. And so I think we'll we'll, we'll let it go and we'll we'll say, you know, good things to you. And whenever you get put down or whatever else. You know, pick yourself up and get you know get moving again, okay? All right, we'll see you next time around. All right, all right. Thanks again, man. This is wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. It was good a, stuff. I thoroughly enjoyed oh, it. Yeah. Well, we did. Too. It's so easy to, to just uh, sit and wing it with you, because I had a couple I told. You. you said hello.
<laughs> yeah, good. And here you are. You're 